Uh, so if there's any part that you missed, we'll send out the recording later today. Uh, so you're welcome to take a look at that or to pass it on to others that are unable to make it. And our presenter today will be Frances, our senior advisor for women and girls, uh, who will be leading us through the presentation. Ready, Frances? Yes. Thank you, Christina. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are from a beautiful sunny Vancouver. I think it's a bit cold outside, but it is very beautiful. As you know, Girls Inspire aims to bring awareness to issues of child early and forced marriage and other barriers to women and girls' economic participation, um, to encourage dialogue on mot and motivate positive action. We also convey the message that women and girls matter, and we also aim to inspire positive transformation in their families, their communities, and the world. And to achieve this, we undertake various activities, including working with gender experts, subject matter experts, and with people who work against child early and forced marriage, to organize guest blogs, webinars, and to elevate the Girls Inspire's agenda through discussion on issues such as the one we have today, gender in M&E. So allow me to add to Christina's welcome and to welcome you all and to thank you for joining us this morning, this evening, wherever you are. Over the next 20 minutes or so, I want to share with you some ideas and information, as you see as per the agenda, on what gender is, a little bit of a reflection on gender equality, uh, speaking to the gender continuum, and why is gender important? And then a reflection on the purpose of monitoring and evaluation, gender in monitoring and evaluation, uh, how do we develop gender sensitive indicators and how does gender sensitive indicators look like? And then we will give you uh, or I will give you an example from our project, the Girls Inspire project. Um, and although this project focused not on boys and girls or women and men, mostly it focused on women and girls. Uh, we do have men and boys also in the project. But when we get to the example, uh, the reflection will only be on women and girls. So let's start with the first one. Uh, what is gender? Now, for us to discuss this, to, to start this discussion, we should have a common understanding of what gender is. Um, one of the main challenges that we face when we start a discussion on gender uh, or when we talk about gender statistics or when we talk about addressing gender issues is that it is often seen as a women's issue. The people will walk away and say, no, I don't want to talk about women's issues. So gender is not only about women. And because there is a perception it is a women's issue, it is most of the time marginalized and it, you know, it is not mainstreamed because of that perception. So there are various definitions that you can find on what gender is, but if you bring it all together, it boils down in the end to the same definition. I've taken this definition from uh, one of the Commonwealth of Learning's publications, Gender Mainstreaming in Learning for Sustainable Development. And I will advise you to uh, take a look at that publication and find some more ideas from that. It was developed by our former colleague from um, the gender manager and with other consultants. They've adopted this definition, adapted, not adopted, <laughs> adapted this UNESCO definition. And as you can see, the short and the sweet of the gender definition is it relates to equal rights, responsibilities and opportunities. Equal rights, equal responsibilities and equal opportunities for men and women. So as you can see from the definition, uh, the cultural notions of masculinity and femininity 
learned through socialization have resulted in different assumptions and expectations about girls or women's and boys and men's behavior. So uh, there is this assumption, for instance, because a woman gives birth, it is now by society assumed that she's the only one that should take care of the baby. So that is an issue that is now socially constructed. Well, because of her femininity, she's the one that will be uh, giving birth. However, that doesn't mean that she's the only one that should take care of the, bullet, the, the, the baby. So that is where the role and the responsibility uh, come in and the right. So there should be equal rights. So now the baby is there. Whose responsibility is it to take care of the baby? What is the role of, of, of the man in this relationship? So we should look at gender um, from this perspective. And then we go to the next slide where the definition is about gender equality. So it refers to the equal rights, responsibilities and opportunities for women and men, boys and girls. And it implies that the interests, needs and priorities of both men and women are taken into consideration recognizing that the different groups of men and women, there's also a diversity within that. So it means that even if I'm a woman and there is in this age bracket of mine, there's different needs that a woman will have in a much lower age bracket. So that, that is the type of needs and interests that we should also look at when we talk about gender equality. So gender equality is a precondition for sustainable people-centered development. We cannot talk about uh, development if there's not gender equality, because if things are not equal, it means the scale will go to the one side. So when we talk about sustainable development, uh, it means it's something that you should sustain. So if the scale goes one-sided, you will not be able to sustain that because somewhere it will tip. So to sustain something, there must be a balance. And that is why gender equality is a precondition for sustainable people-centered development. If we want to work towards gender equality, we should be gender sensitive in our programs, policies and interventions by explicitly addressing the culturally defined roles, duties, rights, responsibilities, and accepted behaviors that are associated with being male or female. So you have, you can take a simple example uh, from where you are uh, in the household. It is very easy to take such examples where who's going to do the gardening. In many cultures, it is the woman but in many other cultures, it is the men. And that shows that it is, it is socially and culturally constructed. So it doesn't mean that it is a man's job or it's a woman's job. Both can do the same thing. So you go inside the house and you look at who's going to do the dishes. Again, in most societies, people are looking at the women. And that is a socially constructed role. So if you are gender sensitive or if you want to be gender sensitive, you will explicitly address these culturally defined roles. You will challenge it. You will say, no, why should we do the dishes as women? Or why should we wash the cars as, as men? Why can't women not come and wash the car? Why can men not come and wash the dishes? So. That is when you are gender sensitive. When you look within your office environment, there are certain positions maybe that they say, uh, the chair of the board must be a man because that is a socially constructed role. They, that assumption has been there for ages. Or the president of the country must be a man. So because of gender sensitivity, these culturally and socially constructed role defined roles were challenged were addressed and now we do find women also as chairs we do find 
women also as president. And the same thing about gender sensitivity with regard to men. When a woman uh, says that I will cook and the man says, no, I want to cook, the woman insists, it's not your job. Well, if the woman is not gender sensitive, then we cannot expect the man to learn something and to support her and to strike that balance. So the responsibility is here on the male to challenge that socially constructed role and say, no, I can do what you can do. So sometimes we just think we are leaving out females, but many times we are also leaving out males because we are not gender sensitive in regard to the socially constructed roles for men. So it's important that we challenge that. Uh, the next slide. I find this uh, very interesting um, gender equality continuum tool. Uh, and I thought this is the best to show you uh, and for you to assess yourself, where are you as an individual, where are you as an organization, where are you as a country, uh, where are you as a partner. So if you look at this, you will see there are two, two extremes. It can, you can be gender blind or you can be gender aware. When you are gender blind, uh, and some people um, sometimes use this word um, and they're not sure and they maybe mean they are gender neutral. Uh, they say, no, I'm gender blind. But gender blind means you ignore gender considerations. You are totally ignorant of gender considerations. And when you design a policy or when you design um, any um, strategy, if you are gender blind, you would normally design it without analyzing the culturally defined set of economic, social, political uh, roles, responsibilities, rights, entitlements, obligations, power, relationship associated with being female or male, or the dynamics between a man and a woman or a boy or a girl and a girl. So gender blind means you are ignoring any gender considerations. So it is as if it doesn't exist. Gender aware, on the other hand, means you are consciously aware of it. However, you are consciously aware of it at different levels. And because you are aware of it, you can employ it differently. And that brings us to the continuum. So, when you are gender aware, you are totally aware about the gender considerations in regard uh, entitlements, responsibilities, rights, obligations, power relationships, etc. But there's three levels that they, they show us here on this continuum. The first one is exploitative, and that is very dangerous. Because if you use your gender awareness, it can be harmful and it can undermine the project program objectives in the long run. It means when you develop policies and programs intentionally or unintentionally reinforce or take advantage of gender inequalities and stereotypes in pursuit of project outcomes. And this approach can be harmful and can undermine project program objectives. So for instance, if you develop a project that because of your gender considerations, because that you are gender aware, that benefits girls, like the project that we are working on in the Commonwealth of Learning Skills Inspire. So your focus is to in increase uh, education for girls, to improve the life conditions. So that is the focus. But when you exploit, when you have uh, when you have exploitative gender awareness, it, it can mean that you will do everything to the benefit of the girls and then you can disadvantage the boys or the men. So in that way, you say, no, but this is what girls should get. But that means you are exploiting that 
negative towards girls to their advantage and in the end you may harm the men so when you are talking about gender equality it means both should benefit in this project where the focus is on girls whatever you do is for the girls but what you do for the girls in using the males you should not disadvantage them so you should not penalize a person who is a male who says i also want to train at the center then you say no you cannot train at the center because the girls need only females to train them so you should try and find an opportunity to accommodate this and not exploit the situation by saying no this is totally not for men uh, then you are not working towards gender equality so this is a bit difficult and tricky but it is important then we talk about the next one which is accommodating when you are developing accommodating uh, programs for gender it means such policies and programs acknowledge but they work around gender differences and inequalities to achieve project objectives so when they know within the community uh, the men they're not going to talk to females coming in and that is what we have done in most of the partner organizations that we have worked with so far on the CFM project. We know in that community, and there's nothing wrong with it, but we know they will not allow a female to speak to the community leader. So what do we do? We are accommodating that and we send a male to speak to the community leaders. We are accommodating that. So we are not working towards transforming the community. We are accommodating, we're working around it. We are aware of it and we find ways to work around it. So in this way, uh, it can lead to perpetuating the inequality. So we should look at what can we do to steer away from accommodating. So it means we work around the existing gender differences and inequalities. Um, and that is a stepping stone for us to get in. But now we should go to the next step and say, okay, we have been accommodating for more than a year, but now we should work towards a transformative gender equality. Uh, that should be our goal, where gender equality and better development outcomes can be achieved, the green one. So here, transformative, means policies and programs seeks to transform gender relations to promote equality and to achieve its objectives so we will attempt when we have a transformative gender program to foster critical examination of inequalities and gender roles norms and um, dynamics so we will continue to examine it we will recognize and strengthen positive norms so when there are positive things when we know this community leader is in um, support we will use that community leader to reinforce his support for gender equality and we will use that person as an advocate for instance so we will strengthen that positive norm that we have come about um, we will highlight the relative position of women and girls in marginalized groups and transforming the underlying social structures policies broadly yelled social norms that perpetuate gender inequalities. In other words, we will now work towards changing it by finding other partners and changing this whole thing. So in the end, our goal should be to work towards gender equality and better development outcomes. So we should actually adopt a transformative. So in the beginning, most of us, so this is no criticism to anybody. Most of us, because of the challenges we faced, we used an exploitative uh, gender awareness lens. So there is harm there if we do that on both sides of the continuum, whether it is for men or women. Then we said, okay, let's accommodate. If we feel that we have now accommodated the situation enough because there's nothing really changed because remember we work towards sustainable 
development. So the change that should come there should be able to sustain itself beyond the project. So if we are just accommodating, accommodating, it will not be able to sustain itself beyond the project. But if we transform, there is a paradigm shift, there is a new vision, there is a new uh, belief, there is a new norm, then we know we will achieve our goal. The next slide, please. So why is gender important? Why, why is this always an issue? What is this gender? Why is it so important? There on the screen that, that, uh, uh, that you have in front of you now, I, there's many reasons, there's, there's so many, but I've highlighted three that I thought is maybe important for this discussion. In many instances, social and economic policies are affected by gender dimensions, even when it is not immediately obvious. Social and economic policies are affected by gender dimensions, even when it is not immediately obvious. Because if you look at what you mean by um, economic, there's so many males that's in charge of the economy. But if you go into the developing countries, you will see how many females are there on the fields. Wherever you are coming from who are in this webinar, if you just go out and do a search in your own country and see who are the people working in the fields, and then you see, but where's the money going to? Who are the people having the bank accounts? And you will see that imbalance there. So one group is working in the fields, but the money is with the other group. So that will influence an economic policy. It will influence a social policy. And if we are not talking about gender, this situation will not change. So the availability and accessibility of gender sensitive data are instrumental to the development and implementation of policies that can facilitate the achievement of national and international objectives. So the policies, research questions, and public debate for which gender statistics are needed focus on issues of gender equality and the advancement of women. The United Nations Convention on the Elimin Elimination of Forms of Discrimination Against Women uh, of 1979 the platform for action of the Fourth World Conference on Women World Conference held in Beijing. Uh, the gender equality, gender equality is also a fundamental component of the Millennium Declaration of 2000. Gender equality is also an important and fundamental uh, uh, component of the, the, the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which were adopted two years ago. So, Gender is very important. And then I, I have uh, two more points there on the screen. Next slide, please, Christina. So what is the purpose of monitoring and evaluation? Uh, this beautiful picture comes from one of our partners. Collecting data. Monitoring and evaluation provides the data needed to plan, to coordinate, and to implement programs. If you don't have information, then you cannot properly plan. Yes, many people plan without monitoring and evaluation. But monitoring and evaluation helps you to assess the effectiveness of progress. It helps you to identify areas for program improvement. So within the discussion that we now have about gender equality, if we are talking about the inequalities that exist, if we talk about the norms that exist, if we want to change it, we need statistics, we need data to show us where are the inequalities. And then we have to plan to address the inequalities. And when we address the inequalities, then we should assess whether there is progress. And when there is progress, we should reinforce it and we should continue until we have made a total change within that specific program that we have started. Next slide, please. Uh, 
I found this one and I asked Christina also to, and thank you Christina for the beautiful slides and also Sharice for your contribution. Uh, this specific slide, uh, I love it so much because that is how I want to see gender and m and &E. It is something that is, you know, um, it's like you cannot take the one out and the other one doesn't exist. It is coexisting. It, it, it depends on each other. So this shows gender in m and &E, how it should be. It means a gender sensitive m and &E plan requires that the gender be monitored at every stage of the project cycle. From the beginning, from the input, the processes, the outputs, the outcomes. We should monitor gender, but we cannot monitor gender if we didn't bring it in. So we should ask ourselves, at the project's goals and objectives, are those gender sensitive? Do they adequately reflect women and men's needs? Now, this is specifically when you have a project that focus on both male and female. When you have a project that only focus like the girl, Common Art of Learning Girls Inspire, there is a focus that it is only girls. But then when you go to the community, there is a focus where the community are male and female. So it is important that we look at our indicators there on male and female and say, what are the needs of the male to bring them into um, uh, uh, um, buying into this whole ending child marriage, what are their needs, why we should be conscious of that and we should deal with that, it is important. So what is the level of input from men and women? So did we go to the men and women in the community? Did we speak to both male and female or did we only look at the women or did we only look at the men? Another thing is that uh, there should be a credible implementation plan that links courses of action and intermediate targets to expected final outcomes which benefit both men and women. Remember when we talked about in the earlier slide about the exploitative, where you exploit the gender inequality just to benefit one group. So when we look at Coming Out of Learning's Girls in Fire project, what is the final outcome? The final outcome is to benefit both men and women in the community. If we end child marriages, both men and women will benefit. If we let more girls go to school, both men and women and families and communities will benefit. So that is why it is so important that we put it in from the beginning to the end. When we collect data, are the data sex disaggregated? And does it keep track of inputs and outputs and measure the outcomes? from what sources is the same information at the baseline data being collected for the indicators at several times during the life of the project in order to measure and evaluate the impact. And that is what we are doing. You are doing as our partners or anybody should be doing when you are doing gender in m and &E. It should start from the beginning. At certain points, you should go back to the same people and speak to the same people again and go back to the same people and only then you will be able to see the impact because we want we want to say in the next slide that gender sensitive indicators it measures changes it monitors progress in achieving access and assess the impact of changes so if you don't have the picture of the previous slide where gender start, gender and amony starts from the beginning until the end. You will not be able to measure the progress, to monitor the progress, to see how it changes. So here I have said on the slide that gender sensitive indicators will measure changes in the status and role of men and women over time. That's central. So it is important when we do the community uh, uh, um, questionnaires and surveys that it is men and women. 
it is important to construct, measure, and analyze indicators to monitor progress in achieving access because access is another issue because of gender inequality. And the next one is at the end, we should be able to see what was the impact of the changes or interventions. And that is, I hope, for you to see why it is so important for us to have this consistent data collection. Next slide, please. Here I'm giving you some advice how to develop gender sensitive indicators. You identify the gender issues within a specific context of the program of activity. And that is what we were trying to do when we developed the survey. But because you are within your specific context, there may be other issues that you are aware of. So it is important that you tell us that maybe we should also ask questions about this or that. We should collect data about more about this and that. So formulate measures that demonstrate the mitigation or the removal of gender-based constraints or the change in the relationship or roles of, of females and males over time. So we want to demonstrate this change, and that is how we should develop the indicators. We should establish realistic targets and separate targets for males and females and by relevant age group. Remember I said earlier in the discussion, a woman of my age have different needs compared to a younger woman in another age bracket, and the same for males, the same for uh, boys, the same for girls. Clarify where more information is needed and determine how this information can be obtained. So this is the type of information that we will need back from our partners. Uh, because time is running out, I am just leaving that to you. We will send you the slides. Um, but it is important that we aim to measure changes in the levels of inequality. Uh, that is very important. And that is the next thing uh, that I want to, to, to show you on the next slide when I go to the example from Girls Inspire. And that again, uh, it's a beautiful slide. It's a beautiful picture of where our partners work and where they have collected data. Some of you may have seen this next slide already, where remember this is only about girls. So you will not necessarily see the balance between questions for men and women, because this is just for the girls, the, the specific outcome that I'm going to talk about. Here, we look at um, an example of a gender sensitive indicator as it pertains to the needs of the girls. Okay, because we have to focus on that. The number of organizations offer new and revised quality gender sensitive learning resources in a number of courses, the number of women and girls complete lower secondary courses. And the next one, the number of women and girls aspire to continue education through ODL advocates and support. Go to the next one, please, Christina. So here we go to this specific example of the gender sensitive indicator. Remember, I said the number of organizations offer new and revised quality gender sensitive learning resources. So I want you to go to, this, to, this, uh, to the next uh, column where it says baseline data. And then you see the number of gender sensitive learning resources available uh, at the number of organizations for a number of girls. This is the performance management framework. Because we take this issue that I said in that beautiful slide that shows how gender goes and goes as the M and E goes, to show that the gender issue is raised within the logic model from the beginning, it goes to the performance management framework. And in the next slide, you will now see how we have taken it and we have broken down that result and we said increased access what do we mean by that because if we want to monitor the change of the inequality if we want to monitor um, the improvement we need to know what it is so we take this here and we said increased access means more places closer to women and girls learning opportunities means places where women and girls can study and then we took the descriptors 
safe, what does safe mean? Quality, what does it mean? Gender sensitive, uh, open distance learning technology based. So we have broken it down for us to understand what are we going to measure. And then next to it, we have shown in which of the questionnaires are we measuring this? So there are the questions in the questionnaire to measure it. Because remember what I said from the beginning, over the length of the project, you should measure the same thing with the same people so that you can see what is the change that happens. So in the next slide, Do you want to go back to that one? Or oh, I see there's a, it's okay. Uh, in this one, how do we measure what we have defined? So here you can see in the survey for women and girls, those questions that I have referred to in the previous slide and the numbers were there. It, it's asking girls about the schools, that's close to them, it's asking them about the, the facilities, whether there's toilets, it's asking about, about ablution facilities, it's asking about their safety. Remember, uh, in the previous slide, I've showed the descriptors and then we defined what it was. So it is important that we measure how these things changed as pertaining to the needs of the girls at this age level. Next one, please. So this slide, slide give us uh, an example of um, a summary. I just want to open mine here for myself, just make it clearer. I think it takes a bit of time also for the... This is a summary of the responses that we received uh, on the specific result where I showed you increased access to safe, quality, gender sensitive. So on this one, you can see on the left hand side, the pinkish. Is there any, is there an institution in or near your community that offers schooling? And you see the answer there, no and yes. Do you feel safe walking home between home and the institution? And this is during the baseline that we ask the question. And then how far is it to walk from your home to the institution? Uh, do you feel safe with the teachers? Is clean drinking water available? Are there toilets in the institution? Are there ablution facilities? If we, this is the baseline at the beginning, if we want to now say that there is a change, we have to make the comparison with the monitoring or the end line results and say, there is a difference. And if there is no difference, we have to go back and say, why is there no difference? Because this inequality will continue. What is very important here uh, is the last question. Do you feel safe with the teachers? And the majority are saying yes. So that is a very good sign of the situation where these girls are. But if you go to the one on the second last one on the right, are there ablution facilities available? We see there is still 40% that says no. When we talk about toilets, there is a 15% that say no. So it is important. That is why. M&E is important, that is why gender in M&E is important, because we have to cater for the needs of both male and female, and we have to make the changes where possible. So I will then end there, because we do not yet have the end line um, results of this project to show you how it changed over the lifetime of our intervention. and. Uh, but we hope, or I hope, that this sort of um, refreshed your mind about why gender is important, why you have to do monitoring and eva evaluation, and why gender is not only about women, but it's about male and female. It's about women and men, boys and girls. It's about sustainable development. It's about improving 
the situation wherever we are for both men and women. Thank you, Christina. Great, thank you so much, Francis, for that detailed presentation, which hopefully was for some of us a refresher and for some of us some new information on the topic. Um, we do have about 15 minutes left, uh, left for our question and answer period. Um, so if you do have something to ask, you are welcome just to turn on your microphone so it turns green, uh, and then I'll call on you to speak. Alternately, if your microphone doesn't work, you're welcome just to type your question in the chat box, um, and then we will read them out and discuss them. So no questions, you want me to talk more? No comments? Hello, everybody. Hello. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I have one comment, Francis. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah, I, I, I thank you, Francis. You, you, you brought something very important. I believe in our project, no one should be left behind when necessary. And during our discussion back here at the Institute, we had one scenario. There's one woman who ha has undergone the same challenges, like she was forced into marriage at the early age, but now she's almost more than 25 years old. And she was very much interested to join the program and then we realize that's, you know, of course, we have specific target group, but, you know, for those, you know, as far as boys who will be interested to join the program, you know, the issue is to promote the equality and not maybe to discriminate one group against another. I understand the focus is young, is girls and young mothers, but in case we have other, you know, like a target group, we, we, we have a program. I think it was very wonderful to save any boys if they want to join the program. I think, you know, since we want to have the balanced equation, then I think, you know, we can let them in. I don't know. No, Jeffrey, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, no, this project is only for girls, that is the focus, okay? But if you want to. Yes, yes. Yeah want to bring boys in, you can bring them in as part of your advocacy team. You can bring them in, in as part of your um, uh, data collector. You can, you, if you feel very strong about accommodating them, uh, that is where you can accommodate them. But unfortunately, in the project itself, the training is for girls, and that is the focus. So this is a girls' project. This is not a gender project. That is the difference here. This, the discussion we have here is about gender. But the Commonwealth of Learning's Girls Inspire project is a girls' project. So now we can talk about the girl that we don't want to leave behind. That we can talk about. But unfortunately, the boys, we cannot train the boys. The boys are not part of the training. The boys can be used in the community events. You can say to them, go uh, start something that you can help us raise awareness and stuff like that. But unfortunately, in the training event, that's only for girls because it's a girls project. When we talk about gender, it's girls and boys, men and women. So the discussion that we had here uh, was a general discussion to broaden your view on what gender is. Uh, and should not be taken directly back to the, the project and say, so we should also bring in men now in, in girls' project. The girl that's been over 25, that's probably been left behind, those are issues that should be dealt with on a case-by-case. -case. 
where you will communicate to my office and say, we have this exceptional case and then I will advise you accordingly. Unfortunately, I cannot on this platform go out and give a blanket approval for any aid to go in. Tomorrow you will have a woman of my age in the project too. So we have to give due consideration. And uh, if that example that you have kindly write to me and give some background, and we will see how um, we can respond to your request. And this is for any other partner also who have a similar request. We had another partner last year where we had similar situations and we dealt with that uh, at, at the level with the partner. I hope that's an object, Godfrey. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Francis. You know, I think for all the team, it's well explained. Not only for the institute, even for our partner, I think it's well covered. Thank you, Francis. You're welcome, Godfrey. Perfect. Great. We also have one question from Sabine in the chat box, which I'll read out. So she says, the coal baseline and M&E already cover enough as gender sensitive tools. What else would we do to enhance the gender sensitivity in the community? Okay, very good question. Um, to enhance the gender sensitivity within the community, as I said, uh, we look at that gender continuum, gender equality continuum, and you as an organization should see where you fall. So if you are exploitative, or if you are in the uh, accommodating, uh, you should consider finding strategies to go to a more transformative, that is within the community, because we know all over the world, even here in the work environment, wherever you are, uh, we are very accommodating because we do not want to offend people. But if we want to make a sustainable change, if we want to transform the community, then we have to look at what strategies can we employ within the community. And an example that I can give you where you already have males that's supportive of the project within the community and that's helping a lot, you can use them and ask them how can they help you to make the change within the community? In other words, get their perspective and ask them that they agree to girls' education. How can they now help you as a partner organization to bring all the other community members on board so that both gender benefit? The project that, uh, uh, that we are considering in the new uh, timeline that we have consulted with some partners already a few days ago. It is to go back into such communities and to go deeper and to transform such communities. And that's why we're interested to know how many people are in those communities. How many community members have we affected already? So we want to use those that we have affected and say, let's develop a plan here and see how we can change the minds of more community members so that in the end there is enough to have that transformation on gender equality within that community. I'm sure I didn't properly answer your question, Sabine, but those are just some ideas. Are there more questions, Christina? Yeah, there's a lot of comments, Jess, also stating the role of gender and how it's important and how we collect that data at the baseline for a project, which is correct and great. And there's so many more findings we could probably even do with that information. Um, Aftab asked a really great question, uh, and he said, how is the equity in M&E linked or contributing in the global agenda and perspective of SDGs? Aftab, how the equity in M&E linked contributed to the global agenda and perspective? You would remember when I spoke about why M&E, that slide that I talked about, uh, if you want to go back, Christina, the slide, why, why is gender important? Um, in many contexts, we, and in as far as the SDGs, there are eight SDGs that speaks, you know, that we can talk about. We have them, we have sent it to, to you, 
SDG 1, SDG 2, I think the one about poverty, no poverty, um, zero hunger. If you, if you just take those two SDGs, how, what is the question again? How is the equality in M and E linked? So if we, if we don't have statistics of the needs of women and men, we cannot address the zero hunger. We cannot address the poverty. SDG 5 speaks specifically about gender equality. But if we don't know what are the inequalities, how do we address it? And that is why it is important to get the data. In your community, we need to know, for instance, if you want to make a change in regard to SDGs and see how do you link it with SDGs, you need to understand in your own community or in my own community, I need to understand what are the inequalities? How do I address? So you have to do a monitoring and an evaluation of any project. But before you do the project, you need to do an agenda analysis within that community. So having the information, having the information, and now as number two says, gender statistics are the basis for analysis to assess differences in the situations of women and men and how their conditions are changing or not. So if we want to, to impact on the SDGs, we need gender statistics. But where do we get gender statistics? From monitoring and evaluation. How can we do monitoring and evaluation if we have any activity, any project? And how can we make sure that we get the statistics that is needed for the SDGs uh, speaking to gender, we should make sure that we have an analysis that tells us what do we monitor. We have to monitor the access to resources. We have to access improving the roles and responsibilities. We have to access uh, to, to, to assess um, the impact of the work that we are doing. So M&E is critical in achieving uh, statistics, critical in achieving the SDGs. So I hope I answered that one. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Afta. Yeah, I would even say in my own experience as a researcher, um, I was researching mobile finance, and my statistics said that actually there was a high uptake of female older users, like 50 plus, and that sort of thing you anticipate that it would be mostly young men that are using cell phones and banking, but actually it was a lot of older women. Um, and without the statistics, we wouldn't know if they were using it, that we should target this program to them. Uh, so information like that really changes what programming you run and also what policy pieces you're saying. So, and it's really often quite simple just to have that breakdown of who's used, like, is it a male, is it a female, and, and to understand how that impacts people. In other words, if you are not counted, you don't matter. So, and, and we're not knowing about you. So if, if you didn't, count those and, and, and de did their data collection, you wouldn't have known. And those women wouldn't have met it. So it is very important to see how something that you, you didn't think. And that is how and why it is so important, as Christina has said there, why, why we should do it. Thank you, after I see you said you now understand. Good. Um, I think we have time. Oh, we're almost out of time. Does anyone have one last question they really want to ask? Um, once again, thank you everyone for your positive uh, comments on the presentation. We're always glad when uh, it's of value to you. Um, any last questions? Oh, Sam, I see uh, your microphone is on. You're welcome to go ahead. Hi, Francis. Thank you for the for this excellent presentation. And it was my first experience to attend the webinar. Oh. It was a nice experience. I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Oh. Uh, yes, we believe uh, as a we believe as that uh, we as a Bedari team believe that uh, working in a community, we can't. Um, we can't move aside the one gender. For example, if we are working for women empowerment or for girls empowerment, 
or for improving the lives of girls, we cannot uh, set aside the men or boys of the community. Ultimately, women and girls have to reach at the training or uh, session venue to listen us with the permission of their fathers or husbands. So we, while mobilizing in the community, while working for the women and girls, we have to engage men and boys of the community as well to get better results. This is a comment, not a question. Thank you, Sama, for that very... Um uh informative comment uh, i think other partners would also benefit from that and thank you also for your uh, compliments on the session i see it, uh, salim also uh, had a contribution there and uh, sabine uh, i responded to sabine's so um if there's nobody else i think from my side before christina says her part I want to thank everybody for coming to the session and making a contribution. Although not many spoke, uh, I see there's lots of lots of comments. Um, Christina, has started, Christina has started a blog on this, so I want to really invite you to go to the blog and make some comments. I will also try and find time tomorrow to make my comments to the blog, and we can also post uh, this uh, webinar as a link to the blog. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I'm sure the decision that can be. Oh, Godfrey, did you have anything to add? No, no, I think it was just a simple comment, but I think since we are running out of time, it was in regard of gender equality and empowerment, and one of the important aspects of our program, which is very, you know, I, I really cherish, is for the girls to feel really empowered from within. Because I believe, you know, like, it's something like a mind, mind, mindset, and they need to believe that they are able and capable to, to, to have impact on their lives. So one of the important aspects, I believe, first of all, is for them to believe in themselves. So there's some skills, but their mindset is very, very important in the project. They need to be able to feel that empowerment and they're able to do something in their, in their lives. That's all I, I wanted to comment. Perfect, thank you for that uh, very inspirational ending to the session. Um, that's all the uh, things I wanted to pass on as well. As always, I'll be sending out um, a link to, of the recording of the webinar and also just a follow-up survey on the session. And we always appreciate your feedback so that we can uh, make sure we're meeting your needs in terms of planning these. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining and have a good evening or day. Thank you. Bye-bye.